one thing we've seen many a time in the music industry is anytime a moderately successful artist dies, their work tends to triple in value. And in some cases, these artists would have their first number one hits, reaching worldwide notoriety immediately following their demise. One of the earliest examples of this was when Otis Redding perished in a plane crash in 1967, and by early 1968, the song he was working on at the time of his death, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, would become his biggest hit, his first number one, and would go down as one of the greatest songs of the 20th century, and has been covered by countless artists over the decades. By the early 2000s, rapper Soldier Slim had a few singles under his belt and will release his last album called A Few Months After, when exactly three months after, he would be shot and killed. And by early 2004, the song he was working on at the time of his demise was a collaboration with Juvenile called Slow Motion For Me. The song would go on to become his first and only number one on both the rap chart and the Hot 100. And it's a classic freak jam. They play that song every summer. And it was also the first number one single for Cash Money Records, which we'll get to later in this video. But in more recent years, there have been a plethora of artists in hip hop specifically that pass away and suddenly their entire catalog becomes all the rave. The biggest examples of this being rappers XXX and Pop Smoke, who became the first artist in hip hop history to have his debut album go number one posthumously. As though he had released two mixtapes prior, much of his recordings wouldn't see the light of day till the day he died. It's almost as if death is vastly becoming the biggest marketing strategy in music these days. But hey, back in 2008, the multi-talented singer, songwriter, rapper, and producer known as Static Major, who penned a multitude of 90s and 2000s R&B hits for artists like Aaliyah, Genuine, and Destiny's Child, had been gearing up for his first official release as a solo artist and with an impressive resume, he was recruited to write a soon-to-be monumental collaboration with Lil Wayne called Lollipop, which would not only be the first number one hit for Lil Wayne and for Static as a featured artist, but would also be the song that catapulted Lil Wayne to global superstardom and broke records winning a Grammy Award and being certified diamond with over 10 million copies of the single sold. However, while this would jumpstart an endless wave of successful hit after hit for Lil Wayne, and Cash Money Records, Static wouldn't get to see any of the song's success, as ahead of the song's release, he and Wayne would film the music video, and coming back from the shoot, he would become very ill. He was then placed into the hands of some very negligent medical workers, whose actions would ultimately lead to his demise. You're watching Justified by Jury, and in the 12th chapter of the Unfortunate Demise series, we will discuss the life and career of Static Major, his time in his R&B group Playa, his collaborations with Missy, Timbaland, and Aaliyah, the many hits he did for others, and his ultimate demise at just 33 years old, and the legacy he leaves behind. If there are any other artists you would like to see covered in the Unfortunate Demise series, please leave your suggestions in the comments below. Let's get started. Born Stephen Ellis Garrett Jr. on 1111, 1974 in Louisville, Kentucky, he was brought up in a musical family and would soon discover his own musical talents, singing in church often as his mother was the choir director, and at the tender age of three years old, he led a 30-member choir in a rendition of Trouble In My Way on a local TV station for their Sunday special called Sing Ye. As he entered his teens, he shifted his gears towards rapping, because being from the West End, he feared that being a singer would make him appear soft, so no one outside of church knew that he sang. Though he did briefly form a gospel group with local friends, where they would battle other groups in the area. Some of the talented people he battled would later become his future bandmates years down the line. In the meantime, Stephen, who was a heartthrob with the ladies, would soon face tragedy when his older sister Melinda, who had suffered from pulmonary hypertension, was in dire need of a heart-lung transplant, which is a rare procedure that is only performed on around 100 patients each year in the U.S. Stephen already wasn't happy with the way that the hospital staff treated his sister as her health deteriorated, and before too long, she would lose her fight and pass away at the tender age of 22 years old, leaving behind a daughter. Stephen took her death extremely hard and developed a disdain for the medical professionals in the Louisville area. He also began to act out at school and was eventually placed into the Burger King Academy which was a program to help aid troubled youth in discovering their talents through creative outlets like arts, sports, and music. Impressed with Stephen's talents, he would be asked to sing the national anthem at the school's national symposium. 
His captivating performance got him a full scholarship to the University of Louisville, where he studied music, and around this time he would reunite with Joan Peacock, who would later be known as Smokey, and Benjamin Bush, who would later become Digital Black. They had formed an R&B group called A Touch of Class and were looking for a new member. And after hearing Steven sing, Smokey asked him to join, and so he did. And years later, he would adopt the name Static after he heard Dr. Dre and Sam Sneed's hit, You Better Recognize, where Sam raps about being a hip-hop fanatic causing static in the industry. And Steven determined that that was what he was going to do, and he came up with the name, but when other rappers emerged with that same name, he added Major as he was gonna do it, Major. But before he had even joined the group, they had already done an impromptu performance for Devante Swing of Jodeci backstage at one of his concerts. And Devante promised to sign them once he got his new R&B hip hop collective called Swing Mob off the ground. And once Devante heard the new formation of the group, he was even more impressed than before and knew he had to get hot on signing them to his collective, which was under Elektra Records. But Static's longtime friend and future personal assistant Tim Barnett said that at the time Static hadn't been attending any of his classes and his grades reflected him flunking every single one. On top of that, he wrecked his mother's vehicle, his only mode of transportation, which led to a rift between him and his mom. Ultimately, he was at wit's end and called Devante to jumpstart the process and get the ball rolling. He would get flown out to New Jersey in 92 to stay with Devante ahead of the other group members who would eventually be flown out later. Static would be introduced to the collective that consisted of future greats like Timbaland and Magoo, Missy Elliott who was with a quartet called Sista, the singer Tweet who was in her own group called Sugar, Genuine, and many others. Devante had also recruited record producers and audio engineers such as Jimmy Douglas and Stevie J. He would relocate and set up headquarters in a single two-story house in Rochester, New York and the collective, which consisted of 20 plus members, were often at work on material for both Jodeci and their own projects in the basement, which garnered them the nickname, The Basement Crew. Digital Black said it was like a musical college. What you had was the dopest artist. Everybody in the camp was dope at what they did. You might not be a dope writer and could only sing, but you be around a dope writer, so you were able to upgrade your skills being around them. You go from one room with Devante, you got Daryl Pearson in another room, you got Dalvin and Stevie J, you got Timbaland in a room, you also got Missy bouncing around, Genuine, Magoo, Sugar, Sister. It was like a college. It's where we honed our skills at. Devante took special interest in Static, noticing how he could rap, sing, and write. His rapping style was very melodic. In studying Devante, Static quickly picked up on the business aspect of the music industry. He noticed how the songwriters and producers were the ones taking home the highest percentages and royalties. So while other members of the camp were focused on perfecting their vocal talents or getting their images and productions together, Static spent more time perfecting his craft at songwriting. Those close to him said that very rarely did he ever actually write the lyrics down. Everything just came to him through melodies and harmonization, as he had such a brilliant mind. Now Devante would change the official name for the group. Well, I read somewhere that, uh... You guys used to be called Touch of Class. Uh, <laughs> where you being that at? Ooh, that, Inside that information. Take that to you. Mm -hmm. Why they do us like that? Psychic. It? So why'd you change your name from Touch of Class to Player? Um, I guess it was just the vibe. Actually, Devontae gave us the name. I guess it was just the vibe we gave off when we was just kicking it with him for all that time. He was yeah. like, y'all got old souls, man. Y'all like some little There's players. Some players. Right. So, so we stuck with it. Though their years with the basement crew gave them great experience, there were also problems at Swing Mob. For one, Devante prioritized Jodeci's projects with many of the Swing Mob members giving contributions to Jodeci's albums, Diary of a Mad Band, and the show The After Party, The Hotel, through production and songwriting. And while different acts got several opportunities to release music on a few soundtracks like Above the Rim, Dangerous Minds, and The Nutty Professor, when it came time to promote or release any of the standalone projects, i.e. an album from the musical acts themselves, things fell flat for just about everyone. A few of the acts got to put out a video here, a single there, but most of the hundreds of songs produced during that time remain unreleased to this day. Also, there was little funding for even the basic necessities. Static once spoke on this, saying, You just kinda broke. You just hope somebody orders a pizza, or you'd wait until 7 or 8 p.m., eat that pack of noodles, then drink water from then on. You'd go to sleep early so you could forget about it. 
That's the worst feeling in the world, knowing you don't have nothing to eat. Add to this, Devante and his entourage had violent moments and would often take out their frustrations on the members of the collective. But once contracts started expiring, different acts started leaving one by one. But Static and Playa held out the longest, before joining forces with Black Round Records under management by Jomo and Barry Hankerson, who were Aaliyah's cousin and uncle. The group would ultimately sign with Def Jam Records around 1997, a decision that devastated Devante, but the time had ran its course. After leaving Devante, many artists found success right out the gate. When Genuine left and signed with Epic, he used one of the songs that he, Static, and Timbaland worked on two years prior called Pony, which when released would peak at number 6 on the US Hot 100 and number 2 on the R&B singles chart, going platinum in four countries, and solidified himself as an artist, solidified Timbaland as a producer, and solidified Static as a songwriter, winning an ASCAP award. Other members of the collective would sign with different labels and take off, and Static and his group would get right to work helping assist them on the projects as well as putting together their own debut. Although there were initial disagreements with Def Jam on the creative control with imaging and with which singles would be put out. In the end, the group's first single would be Don't Stop the Music, which was a nice little groove. It peaked at number 73 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 26 on the R&B singles chart which was moderate at best, but somewhat disappointing. Around the same time, their peers Missy Elliott and Timbaland were enjoying their success as artists putting on other artists, and by now they had formed a super crew, which also featured acts like Alia and Nicole Ray. Static would co-write a few tracks on Timbaland and Magoo's debut album called Welcome to Our World, and Playa themselves would appear in the music video for Up Jumps the Boogie, alongside the entire panel of artists from the crew. And everyone would do the same thing in 98 for the music video to Nicole's lead single, Make It Hot. And as Missy Elliott goes down the list naming each artist, she says Playa's name last but definitely not least. The group was hyped for their official debut. Finally, the world was going to know them for more than just talents in the background. Their second single, Cheers to You, would become the group's biggest hit to date, peaking at number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 10 on the R&B chart spending 20 weeks on the chart total. It was a great choice for a single. The vocals and drum pattern encompassed that late 90s R&B feel to a Timbaland production, with both Static and Black on the writing credits. As a matter of fact, all three group members would have writing and production credits all throughout the album, with every song written by at least one or more of the members, which was dope. However, Death Jam was sloppy with promoting the album. It would debut in March of 98, and it was a nice body of work that featured Aaliyah, Missy Elliott, Magoo, and Foxy Brown. My personal favorites from the album were Top of the World, I-65, and All the Way, which was slated to be the third single. However, the album would peak at a disappointing 86 on the US Billboard 200, but it did reach number 19 on the R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, and as of 2006 has sold around 184,000 copies in the States, which again wasn't terrible, but wasn't necessarily good when compared to the work released by their peers. Critics called the album a promising effort from the men and hoped that they fare much better next time around. Even the biggest fans of the group will tell you that this album was criminally underrated. Def Jam wasn't happy with the feedback either, and only gave All The Way a limited release with no promotion or video. So in the meantime, Static and his group members decided to go back to what worked best, and had a hand in writing and producing several songs for Nicole Ray's upcoming debut album, and would also lend a hand on the Dr. Doolittle soundtrack with the song Your Dress. And for the soundtrack, Static also co-wrote and sang background vocals on Genuine's hit song Same OG and they even made an appearance in the song's video alongside his bandmates. 
He would also co-write and sing the hooks and background vocals on many of the songs on the 100% Genuine album, including the mega hit So Anxious which reached number two on the U.S. Hot R&B Hip Hop Songs chart. I mean, really, the entire group player sang on many of Genuine's songs, but oftentimes weren't credited. But that's another story. Now, Static's arguably greatest contributions to music was the music he did with Aaliyah. Those two made magic, and this soundtrack was where they started off with the song Are You That Somebody. All of a sudden, he, last minute, uh, can y'all do a record tonight and it's going to be the single for Dr. Doolittle? Tonight, after we just did a show, nigga, is you crazy? Oh man, they gonna pay y'all like four hundred thousand dollars. Tell me, you will get two fifty. Leah, baby girl, you get the other two fifty. Oh, I'm there. Static, static was like this. Half sleeve said, "That's it, Tim. That's it. You that crazy? That's it. That's. I said, I think we can work with this one, Tim. He said, "If I let you go, you can't tell nobody." And I was like, I got some for you. And start going through my disc. And he said, <laughs> He said, Oh shit. This nigga just put a baby in it, right? <laughs> Leah said, That's so cute. Boy, I gotta watch my back. Cause I'm not just in it, bro. Is it my goal or is it your goal? Sometimes I'm pretty good, right now I'm not in love Cause I really need somebody, tell me I got somebody now, initially, Missy was supposed to help write the song, but with such short notice and Static being readily available, he would be enlisted for the songwriting. The song would go on to become a smash and a staple song in Aaliyah's catalog, earning her a Grammy Award nomination for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. And from then on, it was decided that Static would be a fill-in whenever Missy wasn't available to work with Aaliyah, and the two became close collaborators, and as she began to develop her new sound for the early stages of recording her third album, Static would help songwrite and co-produce her early material between 98 and 99. Meanwhile, the two would also become romantically involved, according to Static's mother, but they kept things on the low before ultimately deciding to remain platonic. Static would also hit the road with Aaliyah, Timbaland, and Genuine on their promo tour throughout 98, and one of the stops was in his hometown for the Kentucky Derby, where he spotted his future wife, Avanti, after a show. He tried to pursue her, but she initially brushed him off as she didn't want to get too involved with an entertainer. But after running into him numerous times and knowing that Static was going to take every chance he could to talk to her, she finally decided to engage in conversation and before too long, the pair would become engaged and married on September 10th, 1999 and had a family. Now Static loved being a father. He was serious about his craft, but he was a family man first. He didn't spend too much time in the spotlight, instead opting to be with his wife, three kids, and his niece who he took in as well. Still, he was a beast with a pen, and from 98 through 2000, he had songwriting credits on Nas' single, You Owe Me, Jay-Z's Change the Game, which he sang the hook on, and also teamed up with Timbaland for the remix to Destiny's Child number one hit, Say My Name, where he wrote and did the male ad-libs throughout the first verse, while Timbaland did the ad-libs on the second verse. And when Aaliyah geared up to do her first film, Romeo Must Die, which was a box office smash, the film's soundtrack would go platinum. And while it's widely known that Aaliyah and Timbaland spearheaded much of the material on the soundtrack, Static's contributions were just as plentiful to the project. Allow me to break it down for you. There were three singles released from the soundtrack, and Static co-wrote all of them. The first being Try Again, which would go on to become Aaliyah's first number one single and Static's first number one as a songwriter, and the first single in music history to go number one off of Airplay Alone and garnered a Grammy nomination for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. The second single was her collaboration with DMX called Back in One Piece, which did good numbers on the rap charts. But though Static would only appear as a songwriter for both of those songs, he would rap the hook for the third single, We At It Again by Timbaland and Magoo, and also made an appearance in the music video alongside Aaliyah, Missy Elliott, and his group members. The group player would also have their own song, Woozy, appear on the soundtrack, which Static also co-wrote. But Homeboy didn't stop there. He also co-wrote Genuine and Shantae Moore's contributions to the soundtrack, with the songs Simply Irresistible and This Is A Test, respectively. 
Now also in 2000, Aaliyah would begin to shoot her second film, Queen of the Damned, which was filmed in Australia, but she also wanted to get the wheels in motion for her third album. So she would fly her boys out to Australia for two months to record with her, which was an opportunity of a lifetime for Static and his assistant, who had taken a moment just to reflect and appreciate how far they came. And I'm like, cuz, like, nigga, I'm from the hood. I'm from the West End of Louisville, Kentucky. And, I, and I'm, I'm sitting in first class <laughs> flying under the equator. So I, I raised my window thing up again like I was going to see the line or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, like damn, like... Like, we were like, this is the actual, like, the equator. Like, we going, you know? And so I, 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 I hit static. I'm like, I'm like, cuz, 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 get up, get up, get up. I hit the, the call button for the, the, the stewardess. I hit the call button. Static, what's up, what's up, what's up? Nah, bro, we going to take shots to this one, nigga. Like, we from the hood. We didn't pay for this. We in first class. We just flew across the equator. Man, I woke up the whole first class because it was all us. And we started the party over. I hear that shit. I hear that shit. We, 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 we <laughs> Check out the interview that Tim Barnett did with Midnight R&B Edition, talking about their time out there. Them cats went wild over in Australia and had a blast, man. And they took their experiences in the country and turned it into some fire material for the record. Together, Static, Black, Butter, J-Dub, and Key Beats, which consisted of Eric Seats and Rapture Stewart, would be among the main contributors to Aliyah's new album. But by this point, Timbaland and Missy were at odds with Aliyah's uncle Barry Hankerson, owner of the label, so they wouldn't go to Australia and weren't initially featured on the album. Static would also take the time to polish previously unfinished records that he had done with Aliyah, like Rock the Boat and Loose Rap, which featured him as a lead vocalist. They had completed a nice body of work and a unique sound not heard anywhere else in Aliyah's music before, nor in the world. But once back in the States, Barry cut a deal with Timbaland as he really wanted some of his beats and Timbaland did kind of feel some way about not being included on the album. Let's just keep it real. And so that's when Static and Baby Girl would fly to Manhattan to write and record three more songs under Timbaland's production. We Need a Resolution, Don't Know What to Tell Ya, and More Than a Woman two of which would make the final cut, all of which were bops. Now, many of Static's demos can be found on YouTube, and whenever he recorded his demos, he tried to mimic the voice of the artist that he was writing for. And several of his demos, like the initial one that he did for More Than A Woman, were vocally and lyrically different in its original concepts. And I love going back and listening to demos in their early forms and picking up on all the changes that were later made. I'm weird like that. <laughs> but in all, Static wrote 10 out of the 15 tracks associated with the project, released in the summer of 2001. And his group member, Digital Black, wrote the songs You Got Nerve and Messed Up from the album. And he also recorded a duet with Aliyah called Don't Think They Know, which would later be remixed by Chris Brown. But they were also present for many of Aliyah's promo appearances and shoots that summer. However, on August 25th, 2001, after coming back from filming the music video for one of the songs, Rock the Boat, Aaliyah would tragically perish in a plane crash. She was only 22 years old. Static and everyone from the Super Friends crew were devastated beyond what words could ever describe. And though they couldn't muster up the strength to watch the video, or even listen to some of the music they had recorded with her, in the end, the music would be essential to the grieving process. Timbaland would release the song, I Am Music, later that year, which features lead vocals from himself, Static, and Aliyah. And it's a beautiful ode that encompasses their passion, the reason they grind every day, and the reason they do what they love, which is the music. And as I stated in my previous video, the story of Miss You. The following year, Black Round would release the compilation album called I Care For You, which also featured unheard songs from her sessions with Static and others, like the aforementioned Don't Know What To Tell Ya. But what a lot of people didn't know was that the song Erica Kane was originally recorded by Playa, with lyrics about the drug epidemic disrupting the lives of inner city families, and making the correlation with an infamous TV character, Erica Kane, connecting her tempestuous home wrecking behavior to the effects of these substances. A clever play indeed, but Def Jam wasn't feeling any of it. 
However, when Static presented it to Aaliyah, she loved it and recorded her own version. But her label, Black Round, had echoed the sentiments of Def Jam, and it was withheld from her third album in 2001. So when she passed, and those same people were looking for unreleased joints, they said, oh yeah, that one is definitely going on the new project. Also, Static and Playa would make appearances in Aliyah's music video, paying their final respects and tributes to their friend and collaborator. And they pushed it through, and the world believed in my music. And Baby Girl was a big influence to my music. And that's why I feel like I'm like songwriter of the year. And if it wasn't for Static, a lot of people, really, he should have this award. You should hold it up. It's really, I wish Missy was here because the old team is me, Missy, Player, Genuine. That's the real, like, songwriter. It's not just me by myself. It's really, it's real. It's a, it's a team behind it. So, I just want people to know, this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. Player, at this point, had been working on their second album, Throwback Legends, since early 2001. And realizing how short life was, they felt like now, more than ever, was the perfect time to take the group's triumphant return full throttle. The men had put so much work into other artists' projects, the most recent being the smash hit, Addictive by Truth Hurts. And as fire as it was, no one can do the records like the creators themselves. And by early 2003, the group would do several spots getting everyone amped up for their sophomore album and promoting their new single, Never Too Late. Throwback legends. <laughs> it's never too late for the boys. Ever late. Single coming at you ASAP. ASAP. And he means that mother. <laughs> he didn't know I was coming out of the bathroom. I was taking one of them eight ball piss, six ball piss. You know, ASAP. but you know, ASAP, we're coming at you. The single generated them much buzz in their hometown and amongst their fans. It would also be featured on the Universal Motown's group AR sampler and featured on Future Jam's 94, but the single failed to chart. And as merges were taking place with their label, the group's project would be placed on the back burner before eventually being shelved, which was a damn shame. Digital Black called it the dopest R&B album never heard. Not long after this, the group, the label, and even the members would part ways. Down but not out, Static was determined to see his solo efforts manifest and would go on to start a label called Swap Music under Universal and Black Round Records, where he would sign artists from the city and made preparations to drop his debut album, Supper Time on the Fitty Side. Title, Supper Time on the Fitty Side, because it's time to eat. Wow. And then, I'm a feature player on my album, two, three albums, two, three songs, and then here we come. Be to see it. First quarter, supper time on the Fetty Sack. First down. That's <laughs> that, people. First down. I appreciate it, you know. And speaking of this album, Static said, it's time for me to eat. Even though I've been eating, but I put my artistry on the back burner to really focus on the songwriting and producing side of the game. But now I'm all the way focused. I'm coming after R. Kelly and Usher. I'm coming to take R. Kelly's throne. And my resume already speaks for itself. The world's been hearing my sound since Pony. My album ain't really R&B, but it is. The person that I am and the music that I've listened to brings the street out of it. So it's a real nice mixture. It's OG music. I got production from Timberland, Dr. Dre. I'ma have Scott Storch on there and also Pharrell. Ahead of the release, he dropped a free mixtape, Volume 1, which featured Lil Flip, Cassidy, and Playa among the eight tracks to get a feel for what the album would sound like. 
However, the official release of his debut album never happened. Now, his assistant did a few interviews back in the day explaining why things fell apart for the album release, but they've since been removed, so it's not entirely clear the reason why. But the album just didn't take off. Seeing so much success through working for other artists, only to see it almost never be replicated within his own group and as a solo artist, was a little disheartening to say the least. Throughout his disappointments with how his artistry was handled, he would always return to what worked best and what paid the bills. He wrote songs for JoJo's debut album, songs for Jamie Foxx, Sunshine Anderson, Brandy, and Solange Knowles, among others. But as the R&B heartthrob ensemble Pretty Ricky started to gain mainstream notoriety, they were looking for songwriters and producers to help them establish their new sound. And that's when Static would be enlisted and took his experience watching what Devante did with Jodeci and put that same heart and practice into Pretty Ricky, writing much of the material on their first two albums, including their platinum hits Grind With Me and On The Hotline. He would also be featured as a vocalist on a few songs like Juicy and Pretty Ricky would be featured on his song, Ride to the Wheels Fall Off. It was cool to see things come full circle. And once the lead singer, Pleasure P, left the group to go solo, Static would accompany him, writing songs for his solo project, which would be released a few years later. My personal favorite being the song Illusion, although I like Static's demo version the best. But Static didn't stray too far away from his solo efforts too now. He would sign a new deal with Blackground Records and leaked a few of his songs periodically on MySpace to keep his fans in the loop on his full Suppertime release, and even dropped a music video called Bus Stop Breezy and a collaboration with Lil Wayne in 2007. And by the top of 2008, Static had another collaboration with Lil Wayne called Lollipop, which he wrote the majority of, and in coming up with the concept for the song, he knew this song was going to be major. You see, Lil Wayne at this point had been on the scene almost 10 years and had a few hits as a lead artist, like Go DJ, cause that's my DJ. But this single would not only serve as the lead single to Lil Wayne's upcoming album, The Carter 3, but it would also thrust him into the pop market on a macro level and start him on a winning streak of number one hit after hit after hit. And essentially, it was supposed to do the same for Static and finally help jumpstart a successful solo career for him. But before any of this could take place, him and Wayne would come together to film the song's luxurious music video, featuring them in the limousine with the hotties. And they also filmed in and outside the Five Star Hotel with bottles among bottles. They really went full out with the glamour on this one and had a blast filming it. But during the filming process, Static would pick up a light cough that progressively got worse as the days went on. After filming Wrapped, he would return to his hometown to perform at a Valentine's Day cabaret at the Melwood Art Center, which would be his last performance. He would return to Atlanta briefly to record more music, but his condition worsened. With a hoarse voice, he called home to his wife complaining about dizziness and body aches. He told Avanti that he was unable to open his right eye and had been bed bound for most of the day. He avoided hospitals like the plague since his sister's death. But after his wife pleaded with him, he went to DeKalb Medical to get it checked out and the doctor said he had acid reflux. And so he flew back to Louisville, and when his wife picked him up from the airport, he was rolled to her in a wheelchair and appeared very weak. After having trouble breathing, he would be checked in to Baptist Hospital East on February 25th, 2008. At this point, he couldn't swallow and his right eye was drooping. And he never had this kind of issue nor this kind of pain in his life, in which the doctors felt might have been associated with a stroke. So after a number of tests, he was diagnosed with a rare condition called myasthenia gravis, an autoimmune disorder with the symptoms of muscle weakness and fatigue. Doctors recommend a procedure called plasmapheresis that removes toxins from the blood using an implanted catheter through the neck and into the chest area. And right off the bat, Stephen exclaimed, I'm not feeling them effing with my arteries, especially after bearing witness to what his sister went through but he was reassured that he'd feel so much better in 24 hours. The plan was to insert the catheter that night and monitor him until surgery the next morning, but this would later change and things would be rushed that night. Before asking his wife to go home to retrieve some things from a list he prepared, Stephen asked to see his kids one last time. And while holding his four-year-old daughter, Makari, in his lap, he gazed into her eyes and began to cry. The little girl asked him why he was crying and he said no reason, but that everything is going to be okay. 
and then the nurse came in and cleared the room. Now walking down the hallway, Avanti felt the urge to run back into the room real quick. She pulled the curtain and grabbed Steven's hand and he was still crying. He told her that it was okay and to go home and get everything off that list. She said she gave him a kiss and told him she loved him while his mother stayed with him. Avanti later did an interview with the local radio station to explain the details of what happened next. The line that he put in, he put in wrong. So when he threaded it in his vein, he punched holes in his vein. Wow. The doctor did? The doctor did. And right. He actually threaded it in blindly versus using a scope to see where he was going. Wow. So he did it blindly. And mainly, I think, because, you know, I, I assume he was in a hurry because it wasn't supposed to be done till the next morning in the first place. And then all of a sudden, everything was rush, rush. The doctor wants to do it now. And, you know, and I'm like, OK. Um, I mean, it just it's, everything started happening real fast. It was really weird um, how everything went down. But um, he threaded the line and then he left the hospital. Mm. Oh, he actually left the hospital? He left okay. went the hospital, and um, when he, my husband started complaining after he put it in, he was like, is this supposed to hurt? Because the whole time he was in the hospital, he was, wasn't in any pain. You know, his mother called the nurse in, and the nurse said, I'm going to call the doctor. She called the doctor, and the doctor told her to pull it. He's going to take him to surgery in the morning and do it right, which was so dumb of him. And of, I think of her too, to pull, because to pull if the, you don't know, line. yeah, to pull the line. Because really, honestly, if you don't know the risk of pulling a, a newly placed line, you shouldn't pull it. Right. Because usually, when you pull those lines, they've already been placed for a period of time, you know. But you having a problem with a newly placed line, so something's going on. So what was going on? She pulled the line. She came in and she pulled the line, and he had put he had perforated his vein. He had wow. put holes in his vein. The, so the, it, the position that that, the, that, that threaded the it doctor. in. So what was going on is it was leaky right. blood. Wow. And he could I'm feel it. And it was filling up in his chest. And instead of them checking the x-ray before they pulled it, because on the x-ray clearly showed that it's bleeding. Right. So nobody checked the x-ray. And the nurse went in there, la, 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 you know. I'm gonna pull this line and she pulled the line and when she pulled the line she panicked Wow! you know and he's like trying to you know he's, to he's dying you know what I'm saying he's just like and she's calling his name Steven talk to me Steven Steven talk to me and you know it took for his mother to run out in the hallway it's like something's wrong with my son so another nurse ended up coming in it's like oh, hold on wait we need to call a code so it took them like 10 minutes to call a code once they pulled the line out. So, so basically his body probably filled up. His lungs filled up. His, 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 yes, because this is wow. like a tire. You, you know how you yeah. take a nail out of the tire. Once you take a nail out of the tire, it was just over. Right. So it just, you know, filled his lungs up and then oxygen wasn't going to his brain. And then heart, it just went from one thing to another. Essentially, once the catheter was placed into his neck and the doctor went home, Stephen complained of severe pains to his mother, and once the nurse called the doctor and the doctor told her to remove the catheter, she did so in a way that damaged an artery, causing Stephen Garrett to bleed to death. Louisville R&B star Stephen Garrett was laid to rest today, known in the music industry as Static. Garrett died Monday from complications from a medical procedure. He was only 33 years old. So today, the local and national music community said farewell and WHAS 11's Kelsey Starks was there. A gold casket now holds the body of Stephen Static Garrett. His private funeral held hundreds. There was standing room only in the sanctuary for friends, family, and others who knew him best. He, he wasn't the type of guy that lots of fanfare. So, you know, I think he went the way that he would like for him. It wasn't a flash, but, you know, he was just laid back everyday person you know you would have never thought he was who he was and if you didn't know his stage name static major you had likely heard his music <laughs>
He was in the R&B group Playa in the early 90s, but grew to be an accomplished songwriter, penning hits for Aaliyah, the band Genuine, and Timbaland. He also worked with Missy Elliott and the band Jodeci. I don't think Louisville realized exactly who they had in their backyard, and then when they go back to look at Steve's life and, and they'll be like, oh, he did that song? He did that song? I didn't know he did that song. R&B singer Tank was one music celebrity at the funeral that reportedly held many more. The procession of about a hundred cars came through the West End, passing right here through Victory Park, a place that was special to Steven. And music was his life, something that can't be taken away, even in death. Spiritually, you know, he's been with me all week. He's with me right now. So, um, you know, he may be in a hearse, his, his physical body, but, you know, the rest of him is right here and right here. Kelsey Starks, WHAS 11 News. Static Major was most recently working with the rapper Lil Wayne, but Static was also working on a new album of original music when he died. And industry insiders say that that CD, entitled Supper Time, will be released sometime soon. Reports started circulating that he died due to cardiac arrest or either a brain aneurysm. His brother-in-law and his bandmate Smokey cleared the rumors by saying he died only from complications of a medical procedure. In other words, the hospital effed up. But God makes no mistakes. We love Static, but God loves him more. The hospital, however, didn't want to claim any wrongdoing, part of the reason that Static didn't want to utilize them in the first place. His wife, however, would file a lawsuit against the Baptist Hospital East and Dr. Dean J. Wickle, the chief surgeon who recommended and administered the treatment. The suit alleged that the medical negligence on the part of the hospital and doctor caused Stephen's death, and she demanded a jury judgment for compensatory and punitive damages, along with costs associated with pain and suffering. The lawsuit would later be settled out of court. Now, this wouldn't be an unfortunate demise episode without me mentioning the numbers. In this case, double numbers. How both Steven's sister Melinda and his collaborator Aaliyah died at 22 years of age. Now Steven himself died at the age of 33. He was born on 11-11, all double numbers, and died on February 25th. Now many artists tend to die on or around the 25th, like Aaliyah, Left Eye, Michael Jackson, James Brown, etc. Now a YouTuber, Call Me Kinfolk, did a full breakdown in Gematria on the death of Static. I know that not everyone is into conspiracies, and I'm not saying I believe it, I'm not saying I don't. But I do try to keep an open mind and look at things from all perspectives, and his breakdown was very interesting to say the least. Now, Lollipop would premiere weeks after Static's death on Access Granted, and much like they did for Aliyah's Rock the Boat special, this special would be dedicated to the memory of Steven, Static Major. The song would go on to win countless awards and accolades. However, it did little to avenge or uphold Steven's name in the general public. Many listeners to this day don't know he died, if they ever realized who he was. Wayne himself has only spoken about Static maybe a couple of times. It was halfway done because the guy who gave it to him, Static Major, was on the song, Rest in Peace. He, um, he done everything on it. All I had to do was lay my verses. He was like, this is your first number one record. And I was telling myself, I was like, you know, it's cool, but the beat isn't going to be. I didn't think the beat was big enough, but it did. It was totally big. He won a VMA and two Grammy Awards, but never once mentioned Static's name in his speech, which has upset many of Static's fans and even his close industry peers. But the legacy for Static still lives on, and on April 22, 2009, the remaining members of Playa would release an unreleased compilation of demos and songs they had recorded over the years. Many of the songs had leaked either on LimeWire or got put on MySpace, but now the songs were all in one place. Smokey would also drop some solo music which featured a few songs he and Static collaborated on, which is available for purchase. 2009 would also mark the year that Lil Wayne's protege, Drake, would burst onto the scene. And while he was smitten with Aaliyah, he was also heavily inspired by Static and even drew his melodic rapping styles from Static's early work. And he would take one of Smokey and Static's collaborative songs called If You're Scared Say You Scared and use the audio from the footage of the two coming up with the concept and incorporated it into a song called Look What You've Done, which would be featured on his sophomore album Take Care in 2011. And in 2012, Drake would take Aaliyah's catalog 
and remix her songs for an Aaliyah X album to be released on Blackground. One of the songs called Don't Let Me Fool Ya was remixed and called Talk Is Cheap. With Drake on the first verse, Static on the second verse, and background vocals, and Aaliyah on the hook, Static would also receive posthumous songwriting credits for the sampling of his unreleased Aaliyah joint called Quit Hatin', which would be used on ASAP Rocky's Effin' Problems in 2013. Static's wife Avanti would keep his memory alive also by starting the Save a Life Foundation in his honor, and held several events in the area, and even did annual Rip the Runway shows to raise funds for the foundation. She would also start the label Major Styles Entertainment, in which she made plans to release Static's unheard music and collaborations. Around 2017, it was announced on You Know I Got Soul that there would be a volume 2 to Static's Suppertime mixtape. And they had a contest where fans could send in their own covers of their favorite tracks pinned by Static. The winner was guaranteed a slot on a mixtape and a potential opportunity to record one of Static's original unreleased songs. But much like his long-awaited album, it's not clear whatever came of this. In the meantime, old Drizzy Drake would utilize Static's vocals once more on the song After Dark, which is one of my favorite songs from the entire Scorpion album in 2018 which would also mark the year that Static's song Love is Dro would hit the net. And in 2021, Louisville's own Bryson Tiller and Jack Harlow would come out to do a reworking of the song, One Time for the City. They even shot a dope music video in tribute to Static, with Jack wearing the same Kentucky jersey that Static wore all those years ago. And his wife Avanti was present too, y'all. And Static's vocals are very much present and in full effect on the track, as his legacy will forever live on. Many of the songs he wrote would later be sampled by artists like T.I., LMA, David Banner, Kanye West, and Rihanna, just to name a few. He leaves behind over 1,200 unreleased songs, which included collaborations with Jessica Simpson, Beyonce, Janet Jackson, Bobby Valentino, Trey Songs, and many more. Man, rest in peace to the legendary Static Major. Even though you were in the background, you were always around. And to this day, your many creations are never too far from the playlist. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I will catch y'all in the next video.